So yeah, it's me, Carlos Navarro. I work in data strategy and advisory. I have over 20 years of experience in the data and Arctic space. And this year I also did both my DAM and CDMP and the EDM, Council of DCAM certifications. I did those at the beginning of the year and that was a great experience. So in these sessions, I also look to, to discuss with people who are either preparing or have taken the exam and discuss about the different knowledge areas, clarify any questions, and also have some great discussions around this topic. Here, if you want to check my name, you can check on the QR code. The topic that brings us today is data integration and interoperability. It's a long word, and there's actually a small percentage if you compare it to others in terms of prevalence, so it's 6%. But if I look more from the practical aspect on my day-to-day -day work, I think data integration and interoperability is one of the areas I'm working closest with. That's why personally, I always evaluate how easy or difficult it is to go through the chapter. For me, this one was easier because I could relate a lot to the work I do and I always appreciate it. Of course, like many other knowledge areas, some of the aspects are a bit obsolete or could do with a bit of modernization, but still very relevant today. So yeah, let's talk about this knowledge area. Again, for me, this is a super important area and one that I'm really working on, I would say, pretty much every single day. And the reason for that is if we look at today, the modern data platforms called unified data platforms, one of the main objectives they have, as the name says, this unification is about bringing all your data together in one place and then making it accessible by different systems, first by all your different data and use cases, also by third-party solutions that can access the data and essentially you can get the most value out of your data. So that's why having the right activities, processes, and tools to integrate all your data into one place and then make it interoperable is one of the key features of modern data platforms. If we look at modern platforms today, like the Databricks, Data Intelligence, the DMS Fabric, Snowflake, they are basically proposing their key feature is about all this integration in one place. So you don't have to go and look for your data all over the organization. That's why for me, this integration part is super important. Now, just would be interested in knowing out in the group, have you worked with these platforms? They're called in different ways, sometimes unified, other times integrated. So integrated data platform about data integration. Anyone would like to share their experience, their thoughts on these platforms? Hey, John. Hey, Carlos. Yeah, John mm -hmm. from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Hello, everybody. So I'm more familiar with the term modern data stack. That's similar to a concept you're talking about, but like I live and breathe that. Implementing tools, integrating, doing like historical backfills and setting up reverse ETL, and then also have governed data source activate downstream. I love that you're talking about it and I love this section because this is where it goes wrong in every client that I work with yeah. when it moves from one tool to another. Yeah, exactly. You can find like specialized tools for different jobs in the modern stack. So you can find like best in breed tools for data ingestion or things like Pipetron or some other tools that are very good and data connectors and bring the data. Then you have very good data ETLs like T or the data governance. There's all these different best in breed. Now these platforms are trying to consolidate everything into one place, but the features are essentially the same. Yeah. And the other thing that is a common trend, especially with larger companies, maybe software development applications, conversation between having a CDP like segment versus having a composable CDP architecture where they are mm -hmm. like you keep on saying best in breed and they can pair these tools together in order to meet their custom needs. Yeah, it's a great point because the CDP is a great example, actually, of the data integration for customer data, right? So I think that's a great example. And then the composable is, is also certainly a good trend. I also see many companies going in that direction versus the whole package end to end. So yeah, there's a great example. Dama Diempo considers this data integration and interoperability as managing the movement and consolidation of data within and between applications and organizations. This is super important. I personally don't necessarily refer to them in that way, especially the second one, because it's a very complicated word to use. As John mentioned, I would say in top three of pains we see at organizations is bringing data from operational systems into more analytical ones and all the commerce and process from connecting the data, but then all the changes that happen in the operational systems, which then have impact on the downstream systems or on the analytical system. 
once we manage to bring it all together, make the best value out of it and other systems leverage this data, this value, and all this end-to-end -end flow of data from source to what I normally refer more to the consumption part, that's what we can consider this data integration interoperability. It's a pretty complex process. For example, the concept of data mesh is looking at integrating this end-to-end -to, -end to precisely avoid having different teams working on operational data, analytical data, and then actually on the consumption. So try to bring this end-to-end -end flow of data to avoid all these different struggles and challenges we encounter as we move the data from one place to another. Data mesh is still a concept that some companies are doing in some way or another maybe on different versions or taking pieces out of it, but most of the organizations basically take in data from a wide range of data sources, which could be internal data sources, it could be external data sources, it could be structured data and structured data, streaming data. What we are looking at achieving is how we can properly move the data and consolidate it inside a data lake, a data warehouse, a data lake out and get the best value of it. This is the objective we are looking here. And this is obviously a key in realizing value to data. So why we do it, there's a lot of different reasons why companies invest so much in this effort. And there are four specific objectives that we can read in the chapter. One is providing data security. So ensuring regulatory compliance and making sure we deliver it in the right format and the time frame needed. So that's another important aspect. We look here because when there's different systems involved, sometimes there's a lot of data latency. So we need to make sure that we actually can provide data on time in order to provide value. I work a lot in the CPG industry where it's critical, for example, when you get data from sales in supermarkets and hypermarkets to get them ideally from the point of sales data into the analytical system and analyze the sales for the previous day. First thing in the morning, that's one of the key SLAs we always look for. And therefore you need to make sure that your process is really strong and that you get the data all time. Then there's obviously the aspect of lowering the cost and complexity, managing solutions. So that's a big issue I also see in different organizations, especially when you have different vendors working in an organization, everybody's doing things in different ways. Then you get a lot of data redundancy and you get a lot of complexity in the system. So having a proper approach, a predefined set of templates even to deliver the data integration, that helps a lot lower the cost and then complexity. And again, the data redundancy, which is one of the challenges that we see a lot. And then obviously the key objective ultimately is to both support business intelligence, analytics, master data, and also other third party systems that might be using the data. So that is a key part. Yes, John, I see your hand is up. Something that I love about this chapter and that I think is really an opportunity for people who are studying for the CDMP is that whenever you have a project that comes up around integration, it's like an opportunity for change management in your organization because it's typically an opportunity to implement good governance and good data quality practices if your organization doesn't embrace them already. Because you mm -hmm. have an opportunity where you're integrating a new tool and so you have a clean slate with that tool. I find that it's important to identify all the bad practices that you're using in those systems so that you can use that opportunity to implement best practices, even if it's just in that one mm -hmm. hand. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's fundamental that you do it from day one because trying to do the data governance after gets into too much complexity and too much of the work. So I totally agree. Having in mind the data governance from day one is super important. I want to share something about that one as well. Since you mentioned about data competence, I believe that you cannot just implement a perfect data competence because it will also depend on the corporate culture of how the business works. For example, I have a client here in Hong Kong where they belong to the same company, but they belong to different departments. So it means that they have a different cost centers. They have a different IT costing for each department. And then there was this department who was extracting the data, but unfortunately it has to be used by the other departments as well. However, instead of just giving them access to the data, they want to have copy of their own because each department mm -hmm. actually works in silos. So it's difficult to just tell them or recommend that, hey, it's a lot better if we have a data lake set up, we can share data across the department, set the access rights. But again, it's not that easy because it depends on the culture and how the business works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank, yeah. Thanks for sharing. 
That's an interesting case. I think the question here would be why they need a copy of the data, right? Because I think nowadays there are a lot of solutions that provide the possibility to access the data in a federated or virtual way with a very good performance and on a timely basis. Maybe a few years ago was different, but I think it would be good to understand why they want the copies of the data and then see if there's better solution. I think, as, as you say, from a data governance perspective, the moment that you're copying data to someone else, you're completely losing the control over the data governor. Yes, and that's, I that's agree. Good, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because duplicating a data is actually a sin, right? And it's not a good data governance practice. But then politics is very strong there. And then each department have their own agendas. And then there's the one who's on top of them or the executives mm -hmm. that gives the direction of the <clears> governance there's no executive that wants the process improved. Mm -hmm. What they care about is the result that each department or, or each line of business would be able to have. Yeah, yeah. that's what's important to them. Yeah, one of the first things in this chapter, the introduction, what is very interesting is how this knowledge area is dependent with others like data governance, data architecture, data security. The case that you were mentioning, I would be very afraid about data security. The moment that you start sharing data with other systems and you lose the access on security, you are in a big risk of people who are not allowed to use the data to start accessing the data in the wrong way. Especially if we're talking about sensitive data, that is a big risk. Unfortunately, to the case you're mentioning, many organizations don't do anything until they have a big issue happening where it's too late and the impact is too big. I think by sharing them the risks they are facing and looking from the different perspectives from not only governance, but security, even cost, dependency on data storage and operations, you're copying data, you're duplicating data, the cost of data can be super huge. And if you look at some of the approaches described in this chapter, I think right now there's very powerful data sharing where it doesn't require the movement of data from one place to another. So again, if we look in the Databricks platform, you have this Delta sharing that creates a secure connection, movement of data, this interoperability we're looking for, but without risking the governance and the security and in a high performance way. So what I would recommend is doing a risk assessment of what could happen if they don't implement the best practices. It's a great case you share. Thanks a lot for sharing that. Generally on the chapter, we look at the benefits because I acknowledge and I always say that in the Dhamma DM book, there's a lot of best practices and a lot of recommendations on how to approach it. The book mentioned that doing everything properly can be very costly. You do need to invest in doing all these different things in a proper way. That's why it's very important to be very clear on the benefits for the organization. So then when you present the business plan or the request for investment, preparing a risk assessment and potentially changing or strengthening the data governance, it's very important to be clear on the benefits, the value that we get. In this chapter, there's a few benefits, but there are three that for me are super important. One is, again, efficient data movement. So efficient from there, moving data in the right format and the right time, also in a secure way. The reduce the support and staffing costs, that's an important area because again, without having these proper practices, you are duplicating a lot of work, you are duplicating a lot of data. So you end up with a lot of redundancy. And that for me is an issue that I, I could say any company I've worked with have always had this issue in one way or another, because it's also to a certain point is difficult to manage perfectly. It's one of the benefits we should be going after. And then again, complying with data handling and regulations. This is super important. Also now when we have AI in the game and AI is one of the consumers and getting access to the data, we want to make sure that we comply with all regulations on data. So these are some of the key benefits, but there's many more. Maybe any of you would like to share from your expertise while implementing these practices, what are the benefits you've seen or what are the benefits you think should be leveraged to build the case in delivering these best practices? Yeah, I mentioned this in a quick post. I think that the documentation and planning side of this is super important. Usually the breakdown happens in these types of projects is when something's under documented and people are like, oh, we just moved the data from here to there. And they don't think how it needs to be transformed, whether it's actually like in proper format to be used at the source level. And so I love this chapter because I really do embrace more documentation, not less in mm -hmm. projects. And I think it helps you communicate yeah. to stakeholders exactly how their data works so they better know how to use it. 
it's important to gather the business use cases for the people who will be using the end data because it helps minimize the volume of data in general. Just implement what they need to use, specifically how they need to use it. And so cool. you have more control over it. You document their use cases so you can actually take that and use it as insight for other groups that are maybe in other silos. So they understand the impact of what they do on downstream end users. Yeah, I totally agree. And I'm a big fan of, I call it like a data consumer driven approach where you actually first start from rather consumption needs. So the use cases, and then you go back. So versus before where we would just dump data and then decide what we're going to do with the data now. As you say, let's start on the use cases because that ultimately drives value. Bringing in data into a warehouse or data lake or other system doesn't bring you value, just brings you work and cost. What brings you value are those use cases, as you say, and starting from there and working back, I think that's super valid. And then on documentation, I couldn't agree more. One of the areas that I'm most involved right now, which is on transformation to these, what I call the modern data platforms, or you can say data platform modernization is taking the older systems and bringing them up to speed into the modern platforms. And that requires understanding these different transformations that have been done by teams. The biggest complexity is there's no documentation and there's no expertise. So basically there's no one to explain the complexity of the systems and there's nowhere to understand the logic behind them. The biggest complexity is not always on the actual technological transformation coding, but understanding what is in there. Why is that business logic there? Why are these different metrics calculated in a different way? And as you say, because of the lack of documentation, that is a big issue. If there is lack of expertise or experts, then that's the highest complexity because we know we're going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out why things were done in the way they were done. And that's a big pain. So I think the documentation is super important. And the truth is now with all these different GNI systems, I think you can get quite a high level automation of the documentation. Of course, you cannot rely hundred percent, but at least you can get quite a lot already being documented automatically. So there's really no excuse not to do documentation nowadays. I fully agree. This is important. Okay. So let's go through some of the key concepts because in the exam, you can expect to have questions about anything, but there's always questions on definitions or on concepts. You can find any question on the sections, which are defined essential concepts. You could also find questions on the points I was reviewing before. What are the key objectives of data integration? Or it could be a question on what is not an objective of data integration. So that's always the tricky one. You just need to make sure there's a not in the question or benefits. You can also see questions on definition. For example, what is data integration and interoperability? You don't need to know them by heart. I always say it's important to know where to find these definitions because sometimes they're actually looking for the exact definition from the book. So you need to know where to find them. Maybe there's a word that you need to make sure is there. I recommend that you are familiar on where to find them. This is an important part that you need to be aware of in terms of what kind of questions you can find in the exam, because there's been some changes. It's important you're aware that 60% comes directly from the DM box. So you need to be pretty much familiar with all the content, 20% of questions address from your concepts, and then 20% questions are practical multidisciplinary. So these questions is more about how you leverage your knowledge versus theory. That's why we always like to cover the knowledge areas, not only from the pure theoretical part from the book, but also understand scenarios where you would use it because it's not just that you read a book and then take the test, but they're also evaluating that you are leveraging this and you know how to use it in practice. So that's why it's important that you're familiar with both the practice aspects and theory. So again, if you get familiar with the essential concepts, I think you could expect pretty much any of them coming up. The key concepts in the chapter about the ETL, which I would say more of an older approach that was used when we were having the data warehouses. I think nowadays organizations are using more the ELT, which is first you extract, then you load, and after you transform, especially when you are leveraging data lake, you normally first load it into the data lake. And then from there you transform, but even now with the newer methodologies like a data lake house, you also bring the data in the raw format into a layer, like what is called the bronze layer, and then you transform it into silver and gold. From a practical perspective, I think more people are using the ELT than the ETL, but just be familiar with both of them. 
I'm curious, anyone on the call would like to comment what technique they use most, ETL or ELT or even both? ELT, because ETL implies that there's this transformation taking place in a data store that's temporary and you don't actually get to see or test the transformation as directly. Mm -hmm. You can, but ELT is nice because you're just taking the raw data into the warehouse and then you're allowing for the transformation to happen there in sort of a medallion system of, oh, here's our data that we received. Now we're going to transform it very lightly into something that's like usable and semantically meaningful to users in the warehouse. And they can yeah. jump on top of that once it's cleaned and then in a data mart or a gold layer, they can have end user like use case specific tables that service specific needs. Yeah, I fully agree. I would even say that the ELT allows you a wider range of use cases. ETL, I would say for traditional data warehousing is good, but when you start in cases like data science or AI, where you need to access the few raw data without being transformed or used, that's why you first need to load it in a raw format, because in the traditional ETL, you only have the transformed data, so you don't really have access to this raw format. That's why if you want to use a wide variety of use cases, data science, AI, you really need to go with some kind of, not one kind, but with ELT. Then there's the topic of the latency, which I also mentioned before. That's a very important topic, both in terms of the concepts in the chapter, also in, in real life, because most organizations will want their data to be available for analysis as soon as possible. But in some cases, it's really critical to have it either near real time or even real time. So near real time, if you're getting your sales data from the day before, you really want to make sure that you have it ready for analysis first thing in the morning. You obviously don't need to have it at midnight, but have it ready for 8 a.m., 9 a.m. When salespeople come in with their coffee and want to see if they met their objective or they need to take some actions. Or you can say we have this near real time. But then there's really real time data, which you also want to have in many cases. Like if you're operating in digital commerce, where you want to see really any events happening in a web page and when you want to react pretty quickly. If, for example, you have one of your consumers doing some shopping and you want to do some quick analysis and recommend some of the products, you really need this real time. I see it a lot in the manufacturing area. So especially when you have IoT devices and you really want to get the data from these systems if there's some failure pretty quickly so that you can act on it without issues on the production. This is a topic that is an option for the CDMP specialist exams, as well as 6% of the fundamentals exam. If you want to learn more about the specialist exams, we have an article on that. That's what's required to get to the next level after associate, so practitioner or master. Some people take this specialist exam. It's not super popular, but it actually could be a good choice because it's very integrated in terms of the content and how it relates to the other knowledge areas. I think it would look nice on your resume. And it's possible that this exam might be easier because the chapter is more straightforward. There's less going on than the more technical concepts like data modeling or one that's like super broad, like data governance. I haven't taken it. I can't share my personal experience on it. We also have like a database of people who have signed up to be study buddies or to share their exam experience, because if you're interested in going deeper on this topic, you may want to reach out to somebody who's taken it. So we're just wrapping up on the latency aspect. Anyone would like to share any experiences? What kind of data you are working on more? Is it more like the batch, the near real time, or even real time? I have to admit, I haven't used that much real time projects, more than the near real time, but anyone would like to share their experiences? Yes, John, go ahead. Yeah, I think one of the places this comes up the most for me is when I'm working with somebody who has an email marketing tool or a lifecycle marketing tool. And for real time often comes in with personalizing and onboarding experience. And I say create an account, but like in the process of onboarding, I maybe say, hey, my company is this size. Hey, I focus on doing this kind of work. And so we want to be able to send them an onboarding email very quickly within minutes of them signing up to say, hey, welcome. And then also mm -hmm. jumpstart them while they're there in the moment with relevant content. So the real-time data need often speaks more to setting up like event collection and streaming that directly to end tools, hopefully in a way where you can also capture that in the warehouse, make sure it's correct and have it go through some governance, but then making it quickly accessible in an email marketing tool. I'd say that's the number one real-time use case. One question you mentioned at the beginning on reverse CTL. Have you got automated actions for this where you do the reverse CTL so it already automatically does the work? 
So High Touch is a tool that's actually pioneering a lot of the composable CDP space. And they started mm -hmm. CTL tool. It's basically taking data as opposed to ETL, where you're taking data from a third party source and you're sending it into your warehouse. Reverse ETL is you're taking data from your warehouse and sending it to a third party destination. And so what companies like High Touch are doing is they're actually adding event collection to their list of available features. And they're making sure that real time streaming is one of the things that they can support. So it's not a reverse ETL feature, but it's definitely something that people in that space are thinking about, like high touch and census. I don't know if that is. Laura, it's a great case. It's an area I haven't personally worked. I've read a lot about it, but it's great to hear some actual practical cases because I haven't had the opportunity to work in this area. So thanks for sharing that. And CDPs are the easier way to go with events like real-time streaming. Okay, good. Trisha, you have your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to echo what John was saying about email marketing. So where I work, it's important to send real-time information in the case of points. Whenever a customer makes a purchase, it's important to update the data and then tell the customer that they have so many points for their loyalty program. So that generates a lot of sales, actually, when they're reminded that, oh, you have all these points that you can use to redeem other products and services. Then they'll purchase more, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I've seen Amazon does a lot when they tell you that if you spend X more, you'll get X percent <laughs> and then you keep buying things. Okay, great. Good cases. I think the real time has a huge value. I, I always see that companies would start, at least in the areas I've worked with BI, then they would go into the data science AI. Normally the real time would be the third case, but I think this might go through depending on the industry and the kind of business. So just one more concept change data capture concept, which in my experience, we were normally calling this Delta changes in data. Change data capture can capture obviously the changes in data. So you don't have to be loading the whole data uh, every time. That's a concept that also could come up. I always called it the Delta loads. It's a concept that you can also get familiar with. Then there's a replication of data. So like the cases that were being discussed before, I think was maybe not in line with the objective of replication. Archiving is another concept in the chapter. And then there's a few concepts around the interaction models or around the area of interoperability. It's good to get familiar with and the different types of DII or data integration probability architecture concepts that you need to be familiar with. I see a big interest again in the area of data federation and virtualization. Again, referring to these modern platforms, they obviously cannot bring data from every single system and it's even not beneficial to bring it directly into the system, but more keep it where it is. And that's why most of the uh, modern platforms are also bringing in the possibility of this data federation virtualization. If you're familiar with the concept of data fabric, that's one of the key concepts around data fabric that have you one single point where you can access different data around the organization without having to do the copies. Yes, Nicole? Just wanted to butt in and say that people have been saying that there's actually questions about data mesh and data fabric on the exam, even though they're oh. not covered in the book. So this okay. is the 20% of questions that we expect to see from outside reading material. So just go out and find like a mm -hmm. Medium article, a LinkedIn post, or just the Wikipedia page and make sure you're familiar with those concepts. It's interesting to know. So Gartner have put a lot of focus on it because the data fabric concept was originally created by Gartner and they were defending it a lot, yeah. especially when data mesh got popular, that instead of fighting against data mesh, they decided to recommend that actually you can work with data mesh and data fabric. So most of Gartner content right now is about how this data fabric and data mesh work together. You can find a lot of great stuff in Gartner. It's really a very important concept that you need to be familiar with today. Okay, good. So those are the key aspects. Maybe someone have some questions or some last comments they'd like to share. Yeah, I have a question. Is the yeah. data capture on the real time or near real time? So in real time, you have the constant flow of data. The change data capture would apply more if you're loading in batch mode, because when you're loading in batch, maybe you're loading on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. The idea of the change data capture is instead of having to load the whole data again, what you just do is check what has actually changed. That's why it's called the change data. 
and then you just load that part. This is also called incremental load. So you're just incrementally loading the data instead of just having to load everything. Because if you have to be loading everything, it could take a really long time. Okay, it's a data load. Okay. Yeah, I think another way to think about this too is when you're considering what the data looks like in the source system versus what the data looks like in the destination system. What change data capture will do is it will keep a copy of the last state that was sent. And then you have options around how you sync it, such as insert only new rows or update record or like columns that have changed in each of these rows based on a primary key. Or there's a thing called upsert, which is inserting and updating. And then you could also delete records that maybe are no longer in the original source data. So oh. keep track of all of that in order to send only the correct information downstream is what change data capture is all about. Okay. Not only the delta, it can be in real time also the differences of any redundant. In some cases, when CDPs have to keep an accurate, up-to-date record of a user profile, what they'll do is they'll take different events that identify things about the user. And in real time, they'll be updating that single record of the user with what is the most correct information. So they can be real time. However, a lot of that will be speaking to the operations that are native to that tool. What I'm speaking about is when you're changing hands between two systems, it also applies on like a non real time situation where you're trying to have a governed approach to updating information. But yeah, in both cases, it can be applicable. Good. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Carlos. Feel free to disagree with me there, Carlos, if you have another opinion. Oh, I think you covered it perfectly. It's an important concept. So I think it is good to clarify it and be familiar with, because it is one of the questions that could be coming in up in the exam. So it's good to clarify these. I just have a okay. question. Is this the new branding actually in the industry for the data mesh or data fabric? Because it is taking as a technology and domain, right? Data mesh and data fabric are different things. You're referring to Microsoft Fabric? Oh, yeah. yeah. Microsoft Fabric actually combines both because one of the ways it's designed is following the data mesh principles where you can define the domains, the data products. So I would say more the data mesh aspect, but then one of the objectives of the Microsoft Fabric is bringing all the data across the organization into one place, which is the MS Fabric. So I always see MS Fabric leveraging data mesh and data fabric, but these are two different concepts. They're not the same thing. As I mentioned before, Gartner does a good job on comparing both and showing how they can work together. Thanks a lot, everyone, for joining and really appreciated the interaction. The comments and questions was really good. I'm really happy everybody also see this as an important chapter. So thanks a lot for joining and, and hope to see you also in the future events. And for some of you, have a good evening. For others, good morning. And for the others, good afternoon. Thanks, everybody.